we get started, we gotta do something. You guys have been sitting for way too long, so here's what we're gonna have you do. We're gonna do a little dexterity test. This requires no technology. I know some of you are already moaning. Come on, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up. Okay, you need your hands free for this. I've only tried this one other time and been successful, so we'll see. I think this is a bright group. We're gonna figure this out. So what this is, it's, it's a synchronized clap. And here's how it's gonna work. On the count of three, you're gonna clap three times in sync perfectly. Let's see if this works. Okay, you ready? And I'm getting a little feedback. Uh-oh, this may really blow the mic off when we do this. This will be fun. All right, are you ready? One, two, three, go. Thank you for the standing ovation. Have a seat. Great job, everybody. Okay. <laughs> I did that on purpose to get the blood flowing because we have to be mobile, right? Part of this talk is about being mobile. Now, Ben mentioned that I'm from a school district right down the road, Eanes ISD, right over here. Any of you guys familiar with Eanes ISD, Westlake High School? Yep, about 12 minutes west of here, I would guess. Um, and one of the things we started, I guess it was about four years ago, is we put iPads in the hands of every single student. Kindergarten through 12th grade, a little over 8,000 kids, staff members, 9,000 iPads go out there, and I never sleep at night. <laughs> because that means middle school kids have iPads at their homes, <laughs> and I get those phone calls about Snapchat like Ben mentioned. Very interesting thing. And one of the things we learned during this whole kind of challenge of mobile learning is that we don't share enough even as educators. And so we started this event, and Ben mentioned it, iPad Palooza. And this event really started as a way of teachers just sharing stories and successes about mobile learning. And then it kind of expanded into a bigger thing, and now we have was at least a guy Kawasaki's coming this year, and people from all over the world are coming from New Zealand, Australia, right here in Austin. And if you want to hear more about it, we'll have a, we'll talk about this after the talk. But we love iPad Palooza just because it gives us that opportunity to actually share those stories. Something we don't have enough time to do as educators, unfortunately. Um, but a little bit about me first before we get started. I used to be a first grade teacher. Oh, that's me right there. In case you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> These poor kids, man, I was like kindergarten cop, I'm stepping on them and stuff. Um, <laughs> right here in Austin ISD, and I look at this photo, and I look at the year there, 2001. These kids are now just finishing their sophomore year in college. And this was the 21st century, right? This is the 21st century. Think about how much has changed just in their lifetime. Mobile phones didn't exist when, they, when I was teaching school. This is what my classroom looked like. We had these, you remember Compact? They made computers and Gateway, pretty cool, right? They came in those little cow boxes. Anyway, so we had these computers in the back of our classroom and kids would play games on them. And it was cool because you could actually get some engagement, but they weren't actually creating anything at the time. And we played games like, do you remember the Oregon Trail? Yeah. Oh yeah, you had all these crazy ways you would die, like, like amoebic dysentery and like if you break your arm or a snake bite. And we played this game, which I absolutely loved. Oh yeah. it was like. The best parts of geography and history all kind of gamified together and where in the world, I mean, 1992, think about that. But it was great because it actually engaged those kids. But then I started thinking about how much has changed just since then and I started thinking about my own kids. And this is the year, these are my kids and these are the years they graduate high school. So that's Ima, Yura, and Vegas Hooker. No. <laughs> I'm not that mean. <laughs> Tempted but not that mean. <laughs> I feel bad enough for them they're gonna be teenagers with my last name, so it's okay. Um, no, <laughs> Sophia, Lauren, and Caroline. And I think about Caroline there. She's graduating Westlake High School in 2031. She's gonna step out those doors into what kind of world? What's gonna be out there? What do you think? Predictions in the crowd? There's always somebody who says <laughs> flying cars. And I've never met you before, but that's true. Flying cars, flying skateboards, self-tying tennis shoes, all those sorts of things. We, we know it's gonna be different, right? But it's interesting because in education, even though we know it's gonna be different, we still teach the same way. So what are we changing in education? What are we changing in our own lives to make that change happen? So sometimes to predict the future, you have to kind of look in the past. And this next photo I'm about to show you is actually a drawing from an 1899 French newspaper. And what this drawing was it represented is they asked artists from all over uh, the country of France to come up with what they thought the year 2000 would look like a hundred years later. This is what one artist thought education would look like. <laughs> kind of interesting, right? A couple comments here. Um, I love the class size. Seven to one, that's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and another is if you're a female, apparently you don't go to school in the year 2000, but sorry about that. But again, it, it <laughs> cranking that content into this box over here and it magically transports into the heads of these kids kind of reminds me of something. 
a little bit, right? <laughs> so, so thinking about that and thinking about how much things have changed, are we actually doing this now in schools? And in some ways we are, and, and it's not necessarily a good thing. So like just giving kids iPads is one thing, but if you just give it to them just to put a textbook on it, it's kind of a waste of that device in a lot of ways. If you give every kid a Chromebook just so they could read textbooks on it, that's actually a waste of that device too. You need to make sure these things are creative. So, I, so by the way, a weird scientific anomaly, whenever you hand devices out to kids, they immediately take pictures of themselves and put them in their heads. It's just an odd thing. It was like in a horror film. I was walking through Westlake High School and every classroom I just saw these kids, like I gotta take a picture of that. So again, how do we actually use these devices? And I think about ways that society and school have really kind of mirrored each other in some ways. And in some ways, school's kept up, and in other ways, it's totally behind, and that's kind of what we're talking about today. And I'll focus on three areas, the first of which is this one, content. Okay, so how many of you still get the newspaper? Wow, okay, good, a few hands in the crowd. Now, if I were to ask that question in 2001, we would have probably had about half the hands up in the crowd, right? This industry's really changed a lot. You think about the newspaper industry, right? There's a story that's, that happens at five o'clock in the afternoon, and then somebody edits that story, and then somebody publishes that story, and then it's written, and it's published and printed, and then it lands on your doorstep the next day, and the news is instantly 12 to 18 hours old, right? Well, with mobile devices, all that has changed. We're now telling the story. We're now publishing our own news. I remember when the Boston Marathon uh, bombing happened, I took out my phone and I was following along on Twitter. And it was amazing that Twitter was actually faster than the television news. Like I was sitting next to my wife and I was saying, hey, they just found a guy in a boat. And then on the TV they said, we just found a guy, he's in a boat. And it was, and she's looking, she's like, how are you doing that? And I was like, I'm just following along on Twitter. Now, if this is the first time you've heard this, I apologize, but not everything on the internet is real, okay? <laughs> because there's other tweets like, there's nine guys running all around Boston. It was kind of crazy. And so thinking about our own kids, there's a lot of worry that they get everything instantly, right? The news is just handed to them, they can just Google anything. Well, they now have to discern what is real and what isn't, so that's actually a tricky conundrum to be a part of. And I think about content in schools and you think about this. Now, one thing, <laughs> and I just noticed on this photo, you know, there's regular science and then there's... <laughs> <laughs> there's Texas science. <laughs> So many comments I can make about that, but I won't go there. <laughs> but think about, think about the content in this industry. Why can't we flip this on its head too, just like we're doing with the newspaper industry, right? And we're starting to see some of this revolution in schools now, where we're taking items like ck12.org is a great online free resource where you can actually download textbooks digitally and remix them, and they're aligned to state standards. There's Google Classroom over there. Some of you in this room may, understand, may recognize that symbol. In our own school district, we're using this right here, iBooks author. So we have a Texas history ado adoption come. Yes, in, te in Texas we do teach history twice, in fourth grade and seventh grade, in case you didn't get it the first time. You have to learn Texas history. And so the textbook companies that were out there weren't putting out really great content. So we said, why don't we just pay our teachers to do it instead? And so what we're starting to do now is instead of giving those textbook companies millions of dollars, we're giving our teachers tens of dollars. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're actually paying the money to create a textbook that's digital, it's dynamic, it's updated frequently. And, and it's a lot more powerful, and it's something that the district can own and then lease out. I mean, it's, it's a powerful thing. So we're really trying to change this dynamic. I kind, of equate, <laughs> I kind of equate a lot of what we've done and what we've done in education is learning the game of school. And when I talked to high school kids about this, when we first handed out the iPads, there was a lot of kind of pushback from especially the, the successful kids. They said, why are you disrupting school, Mr. Hooker? We've got this game figured out. We know the paper and pencil test. We know the textbook. We know which teachers post their quiz notes a week before the actual quiz. And we make sure we take their classes so we can get the A in the class. And I asked those kids, are you actually learning anything? They said, well, no, yes, we've learned how to win the game, the game of school. It's kind of scary. I have my own story that I'll tell you real quickly. And it happened when I was in sixth grade. I was given this homework assignment where I had to go home and I had to create, it was one of these recipe assignments, you guys probably remember these, like, go home and create a recipe, step one, take out the bread, step two, make the peanut butter sandwich. Actually, that's a really bad, don't follow those directions, but yes. Um, and I thought, you know what, I've got at my house, it's pretty powerful, was this magical thing. <laughs> Did any of you own one of these? Yeah, weren't they great? They weighed like 38 pounds. <laughs> but you could create so much content with these, and I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm not gonna just make a recipe card, I'm actually gonna make a video show, a cooking show. And I actually have footage of this right here. And I, and I can't believe that this would ever be shown on a giant, beautiful screen like this, but here we go. 
chef and I'm going to teach you how to make my famous cookies. Well, the first thing you do is to preheat the oven to 350 degrees. And this microwave was like from the 1960s, so watch the lights dim when I turn it on. One minute. Right? Ah! <laughs> Four. And then this recipe was like, it was just butter and eggs and chocolate and it's sugar. And, and I forgot to wear an oven mitt on my left hand, so right there I actually burned my hand. As a and it's still, I've still got the scar. Well. But then the important last minute after, advice. Yeah, let set cool for about five minutes. <laughs> so, so. So I bring this video out. We, we find the one television and VCR in the entire school, and in the library, and we wheel it into the class. I plug this thing in, put in the VCR tape, and we play it. And the kids are loving it. They clap, they cheer, everything's great. And then I get my grade. And I got an F. And I was, I was dumbfounded. I was like, you know, I'm a kid who always tries to get straight A's, and I was just trying to do something a little different. And I asked her, why did I get an F? And she said, well, did you follow directions? And I started thinking, even as a 12-year-old, I was like, what, what, what's more important? Is it about following directions or is it about actually showing your learning, right? And if I had done it over again, I would have probably handed them a recipe card with actually the directions on the back of it. Um, but still, it, it's not about just the directions, right? Don't get me wrong. We do need to follow directions. We need to learn how to follow directions. But also, it's more important to actually demonstrate that learning. Now, I do have a modern example of this. So this just happened at our high school about two years ago. We had a young man who um, was taking Latin class. Yes, we still. We still teach Latin. Uh, yeah, there we go. The one, the one person who's like the Latin fan in the room. Thank you. Um, woo. OK, so one of the projects this young man had to do is he had to do a presentation on the Roman bathhouse. And he had to talk about things in Latin and what it was going to look like. Well, instead of doing it just like in a PowerPoint, he said, well, can I do something different? Are you all familiar with this game? So, uh, so yes, <laughs> if you're a, if you're a, a boy like between the ages of uh, Three and 107, you probably know what this is. Actually, a boy or a girl. And you can kind of hear him in the background. He's, so what he did is he designed an entire world, this Roman bathhouse in Minecraft. And you can hear him. He's going through and speaking in Latin. And so this is a project that could have, he could have done in like a month, or not a month, I'm sorry, in an hour. <laughs> Taking him an hour and just done the presentation, but instead he spent 20 hours building this world. And he actually still, if you ask him now two years later, he still remembers all the parts of this world. So when I think about that with my own learning, and I think about that, that idea with the recipe, but I still memorize that recipe. I still know it. In fact, I still practice it quite a bit, as you can tell. <laughs> but I mean, that's more important, right? Actually memorizing, learning that kind of stuff, and actually creating it is a more important thing than just following the directions. Now, I will tell you the story of that, that young man. He got an A for that, so that was good. His teacher was very... Very modern. So mobility is another thing. So we've got content now. We can figure out that we can create our own content. But now all of you, and I look out in the crowd, how many of you have like, like one device? Just one. <laughs> all the hands went down. How many of you have two? Keep them up if you have three on you. Keep them up if you have. Wait, on you, look right here. More than three? Does anyone have four? OK. Yes, I knew you would, because you have the watch. That counts now, right? Yeah, see, everything. So we've all become much more mobile, and we think about that in schools. In schools, when I, th when I think of schools, we're not very mobile, and I think about society, too. I mean, look at the shift that happened in this industry, in the music industry, right? So this, used to be, this was a beautiful piece of furniture that would sit in your house, and you would gather and listen to this rich, beautiful sound, and everyone would gather around it in the 1930s and 40s and listen to this, but it was completely disrupted by this little piece of technology here, the transistor radio. And the sound quality in the transistor radio was awful. <laughs> it was terrible. But everybody wanted them, especially teenagers. Why? Portable. Choice. They could, do whatever, they could listen to whatever they wanted to. As a matter of fact, something else happened in the 1950s with music that was kind of a revolution when you think about it. Rock and roll. And I would say if we were still doing this, our parents would never let us listen to that, right? And so because of these devices, we were able to kind of revolutionize music in a lot of ways. We had that same choice. I think the same thing is happening right now in schools with mobile devices. We can now make some choices. And when I think of mobile, I don't think of these desks. These things are terrible. <laughs> they're, 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 kind of, uh, they're kind of like torture contraptions in some ways. And Ben mentioned I was a student for a day last year at Westlake High School. And by the way, not a single kid believed that I was a high school student. <laughs> it's very depressing, 21st Jump Street, here we come. Um, 
But sitting in these things, there's a student in our school who's six foot six, 330 pound offensive lineman. He cannot sit in these. So at every class he's in, he has to stand in the back of the room. I had a hard time sitting through these. By the end of the day, my back hurt. And I started thinking, who has this, the best chairs in schools? Who? Teachers, I would go. Principals, I would go. Superintendents, school board members. And they sit in those chairs twice a month. I mean, think about that. Where, where are we putting all of our energy and all of our effort? And I look at this picture, which is not an old photograph. <laughs> this is actually a college I took a picture of last year. And that's not very mobile. In fact, if you're a left-handed student, you're really in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> But I will say this, there is technology in this room, and if you look really close, you can see not only one, but two overhead projectors. <laughs> it's important, okay? <laughs> yes, there's the overhead projector fan in the back. It's like, <laughs> you and the Latin fan need to get together. It'd be really cool to see what you come up with. Check this out, I'm gonna draw this. Okay. <laughs> so, so it, you know, all of this is designed, of course, to have the learning coming from the front of the room, like what's happening right now with me, right? You guys are all looking at me and it's all coming this way, but it's more than that. We've shifted that in a lot of ways. Now, not just, I think you can go beyond technology and actually change the classroom too. And I think back to an older movie that actually took place in the early 20th century, right? Great movie. How many of you know Dead Poets? Okay. If you're an educator, it's a great, even if you're not an educator, just a wonderful movie. But think about this. This is a great classic classroom scene, right? But where else did learning take place in this movie? Who remembers? Outside? In the cave, in the courtyard. Remember they did this thing where they read poetry and then kicked a soccer ball, and then he had them going out and learning like uniformity, walking in line. And then they had the scene here where like he had them out in the hallway, remember, and they all leaned in and he said, Carpe dia. Yes. And then of course the cave, which you mentioned, and the interesting thing is, who's missing in the cave? The teacher. They went there to learn. Now, in this case, they're learning how to play saxophone and smoke a pipe, but that's neither here nor there. So, but they did learn. They did poetry. They did things. In, so they're looking for that cave space, and our own students do that as well. You know, when we first launched iPads, um, I walked around, and I would see pictures like this. Very typical, you know, students still sitting in the library, and they just had their device next to them. But then as I started walking around, I noticed kids started saying, well, we don't have to just sit here. We can go outside go in the courtyard and actually film some of this. All of a sudden, we don't have to be tied down to that desk. We can find these soft spaces to learn. I mean, how many of you love to sit in a really hard chair to learn all day? I don't know. Okay, there's always the one. So you and the Latin and the overhead person, you guys need to all get together, form like a little cult or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> this is an odd, no, anyway. Okay, but then also when you think about learning, this, I love this image here, down here on the right. This is actually a, this is a Highline dance class after school. And they were, the teacher said, why are, you, why are you taking out your iPads? No, no, this is a dance class. And the kids were saying, well, she's practicing the routine. So they said, why don't we just record it? And then when we go home, we can just rewatch it and practice the routine as well. She's like, oh, yeah, right. I guess you could do that. So we're a lot more mobile. And, and in our own schools, we're experimenting with a couple things. So here's, here's one that we're trying right here. Now, I'll point out a couple things. One is, when you go to schools, usually you see that kind of antiseptic, insanitarium white on the walls. We've changed that a little bit in a couple of these classrooms. We're trying some bright colors. We're trying these mobile desks. There's a lot of studies now that talk about that, that sitting is the new smoking. It's actually hurting you to sit that long. And so having a little bit of room to fidget and wiggle actually helps your brain. And what I love about these photos is, again, where's the teacher? You can kind of see her back there. She's kind of blurred in the background. The kids are teaching each other. They're actually on the floor. They're moving. They're all around the classroom. Here's one where the kid is actually leading the discussion. There's the teacher over there on the right. And you can see I love she's got a little Twitter wall over there. They post tweets with post-it notes. Pretty cute. Um, but the kids are actually leading the discussion. They're leading the learning. They've started their own revolution, so to speak. And here's just a little snippet of video I want you to see of just some of these classrooms, not only at elementary, but also at the high school. These chairs uh, really come in handy when we have Socratic seminars in this class. Uh, the way it's set up is that a few people are in the center and everyone else is on the edges listening. And so it's really easy to you know, move the chairs to the edges where we need to be. Uh, and when we're finally done, you can just move them back to where they originally were. We used to have just computers, two of them that you had to share against the whole class. And and then you had to sit in this one seat all day, and me, personally, my back hurt. Now you can move around Aww. and be with your friends and just, like, you can make your own tables. I think they're genuinely invested in the learning because they're not being told to sit still and be quiet. They're able to kind of do what kids do, which is move around and talk and collaborate. So it's been uh, productive. I just enjoyed the mobility and 
amount of movement you get down here, tip. and I think I learn two times as much a day. The pilot spaces yield empowered learners self-directed lessons and personalized instruction. They foster greater interaction and communication between students and enhance engagement, exploration, and purposeful application of learning. Overall, we found the new flexible environments to be a dynamic, exciting approach to learning. And again, they look so cool. Aaron Chancy, Ains TV. And I, by the way, that kid Jack, that's the way he really is. That was not coaching. Like, he'll, Mr. Hooker, I would like to talk to you about this. Yeah. And you heard, scientific study, he said he learns two times as much sitting in those chairs. <laughs> It's science, right? We have to figure this out. So we're starting to experiment a little bit. Oh, yeah, it's Texas science. Someone said, very good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well played, sir. So we're starting to figure out that this mobility is actually helping, and kids learn better when they can fidget a little bit. You know, I think about my own kids, you know, and, we, and from an early age, you know, we, we try to teach them to walk and talk. And then when they get into school, what do we teach them to do? Sit down, be quiet. Right? We don't want them, or like, yeah, I wasn't going to say that word, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> There's a young girl over here. It's really throwing me off. No. So, so we, we think about that, but also the fact that even though we're mobile, there's still this kind of structure of school. I mean, we're still on an agricultural calendar. I mean, 3% of the country does agriculture, yet we still are off the entire summer, which is kind of unusual. And so trying to shift from schedules of like, when do we actually learn best? So let me just get a show of hands in this room. How many of you learn best in the morning, like after a cup of coffee? Okay, good. So you guys are the ones that are still paying attention. Um, <laughs> how many of you learn best at night? You guys will be the ones that are watching this on replay later to figure out what I said. And then how about up middle of the day, just out of curiosity? Okay, cool. So in this room alone, we have a diversity of learners, right? You guys learn at different times a day. But in school, you're kind of bound by this schedule, which is kind of tricky. And I think, again, back to media and content, you know, think about the revolution of this device, too. How many channels were there on the television back in the 50s and 60s? Three. This is before, like, that one that came along with The Simpsons. Remember that one? That was the fourth one. Fox. So three channels, and it's amazing. I look back in history and I see, I mean, I can't believe I put that sweater up there. But uh, <laughs> my own family had a lot of revolution within them. This is my grandmother and that's my sister, Anita. Put that together for a minute. Anita, thank you, yes. Anyway, so she was married when she was 12. Um, but no, they, they <laughs> no. That's not why I'm showing you this picture, poor Anita. So the truth of the matter is my grandmother had cutting edge technology and I'll slide the photo over and you can see that she had the very first ever picture on picture television, right there. <laughs> and grandma only had three channels and I said, grandma, why are you doing, she's like, well, because I want to watch my soap opera here and my soap opera right here. And then she had this thing up on top of it, it was called a, a beta Max, have you heard of this? <laughs> so she could actually capture it whenever she wanted. So if she missed a show, she could record it and watch it later. Now, I'm gonna really test the age of this crowd and I wanna see if someone can guess what year this was pulled from the TV guide. Look at some of the shows. 78, 73. I'll give you a hint. It was the year I was born and I just turned 43 weeks ago. 75. Yeah, so there's shows like Tony Orlando and Don, which I have no idea what that is, and some, someone can maybe tell me about that later. Maybe the Latin person can tell me what Tony, anyway. So there are these shows, and if you think about back then in the 70s, if you wanted to watch Little House on the Prairie, you had to get up on Wednesday at seven o'clock, and that was it. If you missed it, that was it. It was done, right? You, you missed your opportunity for learning or watching in that case. And now I take a modern example of our bell schedule. This is not an old schedule. This is actually a middle school bell schedule. And if you're a math student, you like math, but you really learn math better at night or later in the day, but unfortunately you have third period math, that means your brain has to be awake at 946 to learn math. And if it isn't, sorry, you're just moving right along. And so how can we leverage technology to really help us with this? Think about the TV industry and how much of that has changed. We have all of these services now, right? TV is now on demand. My own daughter, when she watches a show like Sesame Street, she just watches it whenever she wants to watch it. She doesn't have to wait till Saturday morning at seven o'clock to watch it. And you know what I forgot to list? the most, most powerful, most prevalently used video service in the entire world? YouTube, that's right. Hey, we're in yeah, Google, thank you. <laughs> and the thing about YouTube that's different is we are now creating the content that's going out there too. Just like the newspaper, we're now creating the content, right? And all of this is available just in the palm of your hand, so you can take it with you wherever you wanna go. Learning can happen wherever you want. What's the, what's the biggest university in the United States? What, what's the biggest one? 
Texas. They're like, yeah, no, not even close. In fact, there's one that's seven times as big as Texas. Yeah, University of Phoenix. Over 300,000 students in the University of Phoenix. And, and say what you will about online learning, but I, I think that's a pretty you know, com compelling topic when you think about mobile learning and the revolution behind it. We wanna learn where we wanna learn, when we wanna learn, right? Not just sitting in a desk every day in like that old college classroom I showed you. And so there's this new concept that's happening in schools called the flipped classroom, which isn't really you know, <laughs> taking the classroom and flipping it, but it's, it's for that same math student who couldn't learn well at 9.45, you capture the learning, he goes home at night and he can watch the film, or the video, the film, wow, that's classic. He can watch the video of it on his phone, on his device, on his computer, capture that learning at night, and then he can come back and apply it at school the next day. So we're able to use technology to kind of leverage that schedule a little bit. And so we think about 21st century learners a lot in education, and I always think it's always about the device. People are like, what device are you gonna use? What is the device? And I would actually argue that it's not so much about the device, I think it's about who's holding the device, and how they're using it. It's the most important thing. And in the best classrooms in our school district, where I go into classrooms and see technology being used, it's almost invisible. You almost don't notice that it's out. Kids are just using it, it's just a part of the everyday life. It's a learning tool, it's something they're using and leveraging. You know, I have a friend of mine, um, Tracy Clark, she, she created a graphic I'm about to show you. And what she did is she found the research about uh, of, uh, Fortune 500 company CEOs were asked, what's something, you want in a, what's something you want in a future employee or a current employee? What are the skills, what are the traits? And these are the things they said over and over again. They want these kind of skills and these kind of traits. They want them to be self-directed, they want them to be motivated. Our kids have a really hard time with this one, handling criticism. We really don't allow our kids a chance to fail, right? We just kind of keep them going. And then when they get to college, that's probably the first time maybe some of them have ever failed. So resiliency is another one right next to it. Time management, organization, some of these are probably just for me. I need help with time management and organization. But think about all these soft skills. Now what do you, what do you don't see up there that we do in school all the time and we really push all the time, but it's not up here? Yeah, tests, technology, you know, skills, learning about math, reading, none of that's up here. Now it's important to kind of build that foundation, but I think one of the focuses that we have in education that needs to shift in this revolution is not so much about this, right, but more about those skills. And I think in some ways we've failed in education because we still focus so much on bubbling in these sheets. Think about this. Imagine if you had to go to work and your boss says, here's your assignment, I want you to do this. Now, put everything away. You can't use your technology, put your phone away. We're gonna put posters on the wall so you can't see anything. We're gonna block everything and we're gonna lock you in a room for four hours with nothing but a pencil and you have to solve the problem. That's not real. We need to change that. We need to figure out a way to get less of this and more of this in schools. And I think that's part of this revolution. Thank you. Yeah. And I feel like that's part of the shift that's starting to happen. And technology helps with that, but it's a lot more than just that. I mean, I think, I think as, a, as a taxpayer or as a board member or as a teacher or as an administrator, we want to think that success looks like this arrow right here on the, on the left, right? And I think even in business, you want, you want it to be the steady growth. But the reality is it's so much more messier than that. Learning is messy. You know, revolution is messy. It's gonna be like that arrow on the right. There's gonna be dips and dives. We're gonna have Snapchat conversations. Like you mentioned, things are just falling apart. But we still have to stick with it. And as long as we're generally trending that direction, I think it'll be better. So I'll leave you with kind of this last message. This last message, and it's, it's something I encounter all the time. And it's this idea that fear is gonna kind of overcome all of this. And there's a lot of worry out there. This is a very progressive crowd. I mean, despite the Latin and the overhead projector and all that. Um, <laughs> this is a progressive crowd. So you guys are, are familiar with the fact that you just take risks. There's a lot of risk takers in this audience. But I can tell you in education, it's not always the case. As an administrator, it's so much easier for us not to do one-to-one. -one. I don't have to deal with any of these problems. I don't have to deal with these conversations. As a teacher, so much more easier not to have this disruptive stuff in our classrooms and have to deal. I've been teaching for 25 years. I don't need to change anything. As a parent, so much easier not to have to deal with social media and all the challenges of gaming and screen time and all of this. Parents, teachers, administrators, who are we forgetting? Students. The buildings exist for the students, not the adults. That's what we need to change. That's what we need to shift. Join me. Start the revolution. Thank you. Yeah.